de George uh, George uh, Dreschler. Um, uh, ¿Cómo se? Um, I want to say something in Spanish. <laughs> 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 Uh, well, in English, uh, um, well, uh, as uh, yesterday, um, uh, Ricardo uh, talked about uh, his uh, professional profile, uh, his uh, uh, academic interests. Um, uh, before we start, uh, well, I, it would be great if, if you could say a few words about the, uh, the institute uh, you work for, it's an institute of uh, labor research or employment, employment research. research right. um, yeah. It would be uh, it would be nice to have an uh, an idea uh, of uh, what this institution uh, does. Your institute, also um, a w uh, one of uh, um, uh, your um, areas of interest is data confi confidentiality. Uh, uh, his, uh, uh, all, all his talk uh, uh, yesterday and today uh, has been all, uh, not, uh, nothing about uh, data confi confidentiality, but it, if you could say something, because uh, for the National Institutes it's very important, uh, actually for by law have this kind of uh, 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 locks on information. So if you ha could say a few words anytime about data confidentiality, it will be very appreciated. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think, is my mic working now? Then, because I would prefer that one. Okay, I, think it's, uh, I can turn that off. Okay, so I guess I should have done that uh, yesterday already, uh, introducing myself a little bit and telling about the institute I'm working at. So. Uh, the Institute for Employment Research uh, is, is the research institute for our federal employment agency in Germany. And so, oh, I should, okay, good. <laughs> so I'll use that again. Good, so uh, the research institute for the federal employment agency in Germany, and what we do there is, uh, I mean, there are two two parts. Part of it is really doing research on, on, on uh, labor markets in general and, and uh, understanding the labor market. But then there's also, of course, a lot of consulting for our federal employment agency regarding evaluation of the labor market programs and, and recommendations, political recommendations, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, but I must say, I'm not really involved in, in all that because we have this small department there which is called the Department for Statistical Methods and that's where I work. And we really only take care of all data quality issues. So we are responsible for weighting stuff, imputation of course, and to some extent uh, data confidentiality and uh, we also run experiments on, you know, questionnaire design effects of, you know, how you ask questions, things like that. So it's really all related to how can we improve the quality of our surveys and also of our administrative data, because we have a lot of administrative data too, uh, because uh, the Federal Employment Agency collects all this information from all the establishments, and all these registers have been prepared a couple of years ago to turn them into statistical registers that we can also use. And so most of our economists, actually, they often prefer to use our registers instead of the surveys because they believe that the quality is higher in the register data. And of course, it contains much more records because it really covers the uh, full workforce in, in, in Germany, basically. And so uh, it's a very large database. And we also have a research data center at the Institute just because we have all these different surveys and um, administrative data available. So people actually come uh, to work with our data. And we, we also have uh, some of our RDCs are actually located not only at the Institute, but also
throughout Germany and even in the US, we have a couple of RDCs where you can access our German data, for example, at uh, Cornell University, Harvard University. We have a couple of RDCs there where uh, researchers in the US actually work with our data. Okay. Um, and regarding confidentiality, so that was actually how I started at the institute. I did my PhD on data confidentiality, but it's actually, at least my research, is not too far away from the things I'll be talking about today because I uh, mostly focus on research on synthetic data. And uh, the idea of synthetic data is, is pretty much related to the idea of multiple imputation. The only difference is instead of imputing missing values, you basically over impute sensitive values. So you replace the values that you originally observed in your data with draws from a model. And, and then given that these uh, values now are just draws from a model and no longer the original values, you can argue that you, you basically protect the data, you, you generate a, a synthetic copy of your original data and then you would release these synthetic copies instead of the original data. So that's my main research focus on uh, data confidentiality that I still do a lot at, at my institute, actually. And we have some synthetic data sets published for our establishment survey, because with establishment data, you often feel that the risks are generally higher with establishment data, just because you have all these skewed distributions with turnover and establishment size, number of employees, where large firms are usually very easy to identify in the data sets. So it's pretty difficult if you want to generate protected data that you can release, but it still contains some useful information. And so there we work with that synthetic data approach. Okay. So a little late background uh, on, on myself and my work. Um, and I, I guess I can uh, switch to my actual talk uh, for today now. And I'm, yeah. <laughs> it's okay, okay. Uh, good, I, my talk today is, is a bit shorter than the one yesterday anyway, so this way I'm, I'm filling up my time now. That's good, okay. Um, so the, the title for today is Multiple Imputation, Why and How? Uh, and I have to say, it's a little ambitious. Uh, the title is a little ambitious in the sense that it's a little tricky to, to cover all the details uh, about multiple imputation in uh, such a short period of a time. But what I'm trying to do is just to give you a, a basic idea uh, what the, the general methodology is and the, the general motivation for uh, multiple imputation. And so this is actually what I start with. And uh, then I'll talk about how you actually analyze multiple imputed data sets. So if you have multiple imputed data sets, what do you need to do to get your estimates you're interested in? And then a little bit about how you would generate multiply imputed data sets and how you would evaluate the quality of the imputations. Um, so where do we start from? Just a short recap where we stopped yesterday. Uh, we have this problem that uh, the, the uncertainty is underestimated if we use standard tools uh, to analyze singly imputed data sets. So we had that last simulation, if you remember, where we actually used that regression model, added error terms, and the 
imputed values actually looked sensible, uh, but we still underestimated all the variances. So all our standard errors would be too small. And the problem is that these imputed values are only informed guesses and not the true originally observed values. And we need to account for that uncertainty in those guesses and standard software simply cannot do that. So the question is how can we estimate this uncertainty that comes uh, from imputation? And, and this is where multiple imputation comes into play because with multiple imputation, the basic idea is, is really simple. Instead of imputing those missing values only once, you just impute them multiple times. Because if, you, if you'd already draw from that model, you can simply repeatedly draw from your imputation model. And then you have several imputed data sets where in each of the imputed data sets, the original values, of course, the observed values will be the same, but you have imputed values that vary between the data sets just because you take random draws from your models, okay? So now you, you might have, say, five or 10 of these imputed data sets. So you have nice fully observed data sets again, and, and then you analyze each of those imputed data sets just using your standard complete methods that you would use for complete data. And then you simply combine the results that you get from each of those data sets. So you would run your regression analysis, say, on each of those 10 data sets. Now you have 10 different estimates for each of the regression coefficients, and then you need to combine those results to get your final estimates you're interested in. Um, that's the basic idea. And obviously that only works if uh, your imputations are repeated random draws from the predictive distribution of the missing values under the model that you specified. Because if you would do deterministic imputation, you can do that multiple times, but of course then you would always have the same imputed value in each of your data sets. So there would be no difference between the imputed data sets, right? So you need to have these random draws where the imputed values would be different in each of the imputed data sets. And um, basically any imputation method that involves drawing from a distribution can be converted into a multiple imputation method. And I think that's an important point because often there is a criticism that multiple imputation is so complicated. Uh, and I don't think it's true. The complicated part is to define a good imputation model. That's really hard. That's always hard. But that would be true for single imputation as well. It's just finding this good, good model for imputation is the tricky part. But then just doing it multiple times, that's not the, not the hard step, I think. So for example, if you think of hot deck imputation, we heard yesterday, or I learned yesterday, that hot deck imputation is also used here. Um, quite a lot. So if you want to turn your hot deck imputation into a multiple imputation hot deck, you would simply, instead of only finding the, the closest donor, um, you would identify a set of potential donors and then repeatedly draw from those possible donors. So if you, if you use nearest neighbor hot deck, for example, you would look for, say, the 20 closest records and then draw, randomly draw five of, of them, for example. Okay, so then you would have a multiple imputation hot deck. And if you do a regression model, so if just like in the, in the example, the last example we had yesterday, so if you, if you run your, your regression and add that error term, instead of adding that error term only once, you just add that error term a couple of times. Right? So you repeatedly draw errors that you add to your predictive model, okay? This is pretty straightforward, but these models would be considered improper in, in, in Rubin's terms, uh, because if you, if you have a method, if you want to have a method that is fully proper, you need also to account for the uncertainty in the parameter estimation. And I don't want to go too much into detail about that, 
But in some sense, you can imagine we always estimate that model only on the observed data, right? Because we cannot estimate the model on the full data just because some information is missing. So then we have, you can, you can imagine that like an additional sampling step, right? Your, your, fully, your fully observed data would be the standard sample that you draw. But then you only, again, you, you only have a subset of that, just like another sampling step. So there's some additional uncertainty in those parameters that you estimate in your model and you, you again need to account for that. It doesn't add too much variance, but you can show if you don't do that, you would still underestimate the variance. So we also need to redraw those parameters from their distributions. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. And here's a little motivation about why this, this general approach works. So if you remember from yesterday, what we are really interested in is the distribution of those parameters, whatever we want to estimate. I call them Q here. So these are my parameters from my analysis model. So again, could just be a mean or could be any regression coefficient or anything. But we're interested in, in these parameters given the observed data, right? And what we can do to, to obtain the distribution for these parameters is we do the following step. So uh, you can think of, if we look at that distribution, we can simply say, okay, now I'm looking at the joint distribution of my parameters and my missing values in Y, and I'm simply integrating over Y miss again. So if I do that, I just come back to the marginal distribution of Q, okay? And I can rewrite that, that joint distribution. So the joint distribution is always the conditional distribution times the marginal distribution. Okay, so I have the joint distribution of Q and Y miss. This is just the conditional distribution of Q given Y miss times Y miss. Okay, so I'm just rewriting that. Um, so we are a little more technical today uh, than yesterday, but it's early in the morning, so I thought, you know, you're still fresh and awake. Um, so uh, the thing is, this is what we actually, conceptually, is what we want to do. We want to integrate over the missing data. And you can generally approximate any integral by using Monte Carlo simulations. So Monte Carlo simulations would just work like this. You take a draw from this distribution. So you have a draw from Y miss. You plug that Y miss into this distribution, and then you take a draw from Q, right? So this would just be standard Monte Carlo simulation. But if you think about that, this is actually just the two steps. It's the imputation step and the analysis step. Because here, we are taking draws for the missing values. So we are imputing the missing values by taking a draw from the distribution of the missing values given the observed data. And now once I have that imputed value, I plug that in here. And of course, if we condition on Y miss and Y ops, it's just like we're looking now at the complete on the fully observed data. So if, if no values were missing anymore. So this would just be my analysis model now based on all the data, not only on the observed data, but as if my data would have been fully observed, right? So for this step, I can use any standard method again, because now I'm conditioning not only on the observed part, as I do here, but on the missing part and on the observed part, okay? So these are basically the two steps. I'm uh, the imputation step, where I impute my missing values, and then the analysis step, where I analyze my fully imputed and fully observed data again, okay? And I would just do that a large number of times, uh, and this would be my Monte Carlo simulation. So if I would do that over and over again, I could get an estimate for the distribution of Q given Y ops, okay? But um, if you're only interested in the first two moments, so if we're only interested in, in in the mean of that distribution and its variance, 
we can just do a few iterations instead of running thousands of iterations, which you typically would do in a Monte Carlo simulation. And that's really the, the core idea of multiple imputation. So in the first step, you repeatedly impute the missing values. So you repeatedly draw from this distribution. Now I have 5, 10, 20, 50, how many imputed data sets you want to generate. But this is the imputation step, right? So I take m draws from this distribution to get m imputed data sets. Okay? And in the second step, I simply analyze my data as if it would have been fully observed. So I have my 10 fully imputed data sets, and I treat them as if they were fully observed, and I just analyze them. And in my first, uh, third step, finally, I need to combine the estimates I get from these different imputations uh, to get uh, um, estimates for the first two moments, so for the mean and the variance of this posterior distribution. Okay. Um, this is as technical as we get, so I'm, I won't get any more technical. Um, but some general features uh, about multiple imputation. Uh, the good thing about multiple imputation is that it really provides consistent standard errors under broad classes of imputation procedures, so you can use various imputation procedures, and it's uh, particularly useful in a situation uh, where a single data set uh, is created for multiple users. And we already discussed that a little bit yesterday where um, we had that situation where you want to make sure that different users get consistent results. Because otherwise, if you provide the data with all the missing still in them, then each user would come up with his or her own strategy for dealing with the missings or not dealing with the missings. And then depending on what you do at that step, you will get different results uh, from your data. And if there's a stage where the imputation is done before the data is provided to the users, then you can at least ensure that there will be no differences in the results just based on strategies for dealing with the missing data. Right? So it's just ensuring consistency. And this can be especially useful, this, uh, the, the imputation in general, um, if the data provider has more information about non-respondents than the data analysts. Because this is typically the case, especially if the data should be disseminated uh, to the public, because often you cannot release all the information for data confidentiality reasons. So, Typical example, you would uh, use age groups instead of providing exact age in your release data. You might also provide income only in, in brackets and intervals and not release the exact income information for data confidentiality reasons. And so that obviously means that there is some loss of information in the release data, but the data provider still has all that information available. And if you remember from yesterday, it's always good to condition on as many variables as possible in, in your imputation model just to make the missing at random assumption more plausible and also to get better predictions of your uh, missing values. So in that sense, it's good if the data provider can really use all the data, all the information that is available at that stage. And that also includes auxiliary information that is often collected, like about the response process when the interviewers collect information on how often they needed to contact the person before an interview actually took place. Or if it's uh, personal interviews, now interviewers often record information about what's the surrounding neighborhood the, the person is living in so that you have some background information on the social status in, in some sense. And all this information can be used in the, at the imputation stage, and this might not be available to analysts later. So in that sense, it's often a good idea to have the imputation uh, done at, a, at 
at the stage before the general public will use the data and analyze the data. Okay. And in general, multiple imputation will provide valid results under missing completely at random and under missing at random. It can also provide valid results on the missing not at random, but again, just as mentioned yesterday already, we would specifically need to set up a model for the response mechanism and we cannot test that model uh, based on our data. But now, once we generated those imputed data sets, how do we actually analyze them? How do we get our final point estimate and our final variance estimate we are actually interested in? So we're thinking again of that, that uh, parameter Q as being our final parameter of interest, so our final analysis model that we actually want to estimate. And capital Q is the parameter in the population, okay? So this is the one for which we want to get an estimate. And if we assume that if we would not have any missing data, we have that small Q as the point estimate for capital Q. So again, you compute the sample mean as your estimate for the population mean, right? So the sample mean would be my small Q, capital Q is the population mean, okay? And U now is the, the variance associated with that point estimate. So with that example, again, the sample mean, my U would be sigma squared over N, right? The variance of the mean of the estimated mean is sigma squared over N, okay? So this would be the ones I use if I had the data fully observed. And now we call, oops, we, we use QI and UI to denote the same quantities in each of my imputed data sets. Okay, so in my first data set, I compute the mean for the variable I'm interested in. In the second data set, I compute the mean. These would be my different QIs, Q1, 2, 3, 4, 5, based on my five imputed data sets. And the same again for the variance estimate. Okay. And then I generally need three quantities uh, for my final point estimate and my final variance estimate. The first thing is simply the average of all my point estimates, okay? So I have my five or 10 means that I computed from my imputed data sets, and I simply take the average of all those means. That's my Q bar M. And then I look at the variance between those point estimates. So how much do my point estimates that I get from each of the data sets, how much do they differ? I compute the variance between my imputed data sets. That's my BM. And then I have U bar M. U bar M is just the average of the variances that I get from each of my data sets. So the average of those sigma squared over Ns that I computed for each of my data sets, okay? And here you you already see what, what the important contribution of multiple imputation is. Now I can compute this BM, the variance that I get from the fact that some of my values are imputed. Because I, now I have the chance to, to actually estimate the uncertainty that comes from imputation. Because if there would be no uncertainty from imputation, my QIs, of course, would always be the same on each of the imputed data sets so that BM would be zero, right? But just because those values differ between the imputed data sets, I have a variance there. And this is the variance that comes from imputation and I need to take that variance into account. And with multiple imputation, I have a way to do that because now I can repeat my results on the different imputed data sets and by this, uh, be able to estimate that uncertainty that comes from imputation, okay? And now my, my final estimate. So I'm interested again in the, in the point estimate and the variance estimate based on the imputed data set, okay? And the point estimate, very simple, is just the average of those individual estimates that I got from each of my imputed data sets. So my point estimate is simply Q bar M. And the variance estimate 
basically has two components. It's just the sum of u bar m and bm. So you have that variance within imputation, so the variance that you would get anyway, even if you had fully observed data. And then you have this between imputation, the bm. That's the variance, the additional variance that comes from the fact that part of my data was missing and I can only estimate what those missing values should have been, okay? And you can see if I would use an infinite number of imputations, this thing here would go away and I would simply have u bar m plus bm, right? So just the two components. And the fact that we still have that uh, one over m here is only uh, accounting for the fact that I have a finite number of imputations. So if I would generate an infinite number of imputations, uh, I would not need to have this adjustment factor, but this adjustment factor, the one over m here, is just included because we will only generate, say, five or 10 or 50 imputed data sets, okay? Um, An uh, important quantity that is often reported is this RM. It's the relative increase in conditional variance due to non-response. Because if we had no non-response, we could simply use that U bar M, right? U bar M would be simply sigma squared over, over N. So this is the variance that I would have in my estimate, even if my data would be fully observed. And of course, we have this part here as an additional factor. So my variance now increases by this part, one plus one over m times bm, because of non-response. Okay, so if I look at the ratio of those two, bm over u bar m, this is my relative increase in variance due to non-response. Okay, so this is often reported in software output. So that's why I, uh, have it up here. And now if, we, if we're interested in computing confidence intervals, so now we know how to estimate our point estimate, we know how to estimate the variance, now we want to compute a confidence interval. You can show that uh, the estimates based on multiply imputed data follow a T distribution, okay? So it's not uh, for the mean, in, in general you would it would follow a normal distribution of the data would be fully observed. But with the multiply imputed data sets, now our estimate follows a T distribution and with this degrees of freedom. I mean, you don't need to worry about that too much because again, all any software would compute that for you these days. Um, but so this would be the, the, the the estimates that you use if you're interested in, in univariate estimates, regression coefficients, means, et cetera. Uh, but there are similar combining rules uh, for multivariate estimates. So for example, if you wanted to test whether several of your uh, regression coefficients in your model are zero or not, so standard Walt tests, for example, or if you would do likelihood ratio tests. You can do that with multiple and multiply imputed data sets too. Again, you need to adjust the estimates to account for the fact that parts of the data are imputed and there are formulas for that too. And I don't want to take you through all of that, but again, this is all implemented uh, in statistical software these days. Um, I just have one example to take you through these analysis steps to hopefully make that a little more clear. Again, just assume we have that one variable y for which we imputed the missing values five times, okay? And so now we have these five imputed versions of y, y1 to y5. And we are interested, again, in estimating the mean. I always use the mean just because it's uh, simple to illustrate. So. Now, the first thing you would do is you compute the mean in each of your imputed data sets, okay? So this is my y bar i here, okay? So I have the mean now based on each of the imputed data sets. Then I simply take the average of those 
y bars that I computed. So I simply sum my five y bars divided by five. Okay, just take the average of the means. And then I do the same thing with my variance estimates. Okay, I compute sigma squared over n based on each of my imputed data sets. These are my UIs. And then again, I take the average of those. So I'm averaging over those five sigma squared over n's that I computed based on each of the imputed data sets. And the final quantity that I'm still missing is the BM, the variance between the imputed data sets. So now I take all my point estimates and look at the variance. So my point estimate again is, is my mean for each of the imputed data sets. And I need to take Q bar M, so just the average of those means. So I compute the variance of those point estimates. And once I did that, I'm ready to get my final inferences. So I got my point estimate. So my estimated mean is simply this Q bar, so the average of those means. And if I want to estimate the variance of that mean, I need to use this formula here. So I simply need to plug in what I had on the previous slides, such so as the average of my variances, and then take uh, compute my BM here and adjust that by the factor one plus one over M, so one plus one over five in my case, because I had five imputed data sets, okay? And you could do similar things with regression coefficients, of course, where now my QI would be just the regression coefficient from each of the uh, imputed data sets and the variance then would be uh, sigma squared times x times x to the power of minus one, right? So the variance of the regression coefficients in sigma square will be the residual uh, from my regression model. Uh, some properties of these combining rules, so they are generally termed Rubin's combining rules because John Rubin developed them. The, the nice feature about them is that they are really generic in the, in the sense that you can apply them for any type of analysis and it doesn't matter where whether the missingness of you for example if you have regression models it doesn't matter whether the missingness is in the dependent variable or whether it's in the exponential variables uh, no matter what you do basically once you imputed your data set you can simply use your standard analysis compute those QIs compute those UIs use those combining rules and you're done okay um, and you can show that these estimates, because it's all developed from a Bayesian perspective, but um, Don Rubin showed in his book that in general you, you get good frequentive properties as well uh, for a small number of imputations. So, I mean, I still have that M less than 10, but as Joe said uh, yesterday, uh, if it's not too burdensome, it's always a good idea to just generate more imputed data sets. Because in general, your, your estimates will only stabilize. And you can only get better if you have more imputed data sets. It's just, it might take a little longer, but these days with the computational power, there's no reason not to generate 50 or 100 data sets, okay? Uh, an important thing that you have to keep in mind is that the combining rules assume that if the data would have been fully observed, those estimators I'm looking at would have been approximately normally distributed. Okay, so for the mean, this is no problem. We know the sample mean is normally distributed. If you use maximum likelihood estimates, in general, this is no problem. They will be normally distributed, at least approximately, if your sample size is large enough. But you need to keep that in mind because this doesn't hold for all estimators and so sometimes it makes sense to use some rescaling uh, before you use the combining rules and one example is uh, if you fit a logic model for example a logistic regression model you typically would take the exponential of the regression coefficients if you want to interpret your results right because then you can interpret them directly as as the odds ratios um, 
but if you use the combining rules, you should use them on the original estimates from your model. So you should use the estimates from your model, apply the combining rules, and only after you apply the combining rules, then you take the exponent of, of that, but not the other way around. So you should not first exponentiate and then average over the imputed data sets, but the other way around. Just because if you take the exponential, the estimates you get are no longer normally distributed. Whereas for the, for the uh, parameters on the original scale, uh, this normal approximation is, is okay in most cases. Okay, so this is something just to keep in the back of your mind that you should not simply use that for any estimate. So for example, the same holds if you want to look at R squared from your regression model. You want to look at the uh, fit of your model. You want to look at, at, the, at the R squared value. You cannot simply take the, the average of the R squared from each of those models. Um, because R squared is always bounded between uh, zero and one. So obviously it's not normally distributed. And there are some adjustment methods that you can apply so that you can still compute R squared based on the multiply imputed data sets, but you should not simply use them, those combining rules in this case. Okay. And of course another requirement is that you have reliable estimates for those first two moments uh, for the complete data. So you need to be able to estimate QI and UI, which uh, makes sense because otherwise, how would you use those combining rules if you cannot get uh, good estimates for those? Um, an important thing is that these uh, combining rules are only strictly valid if we have this congeniality that Joe also mentioned. Uh, yesterday and again congeniality is not really easy to to uh, fully understand and I, I agree when I tried to to read that paper by Shaoli Meng in 1994 that Joe mentioned yesterday I, I think I read it now five or six times and, and I think I, I'm, I'm finally starting to understand what, what Shaoli is trying to illustrate there um, the bad news is that in the meantime, he published a new paper in 2014, 15, something in Statistica Sinica that's even more technical. And uh, I'm, I printed it out, but I'm still carrying it with me and haven't found the, uh, the courage to start reading it. It's really only formulas. Uh, so really getting into the details about this continuity is tricky. But the basic idea, I think, is, is I mean, makes a lot of sense. You really only have continuity when the model of the analyst and the imputation model are basically based on the same assumptions. You use the same type of model and um, they basically, uh, so if you think of regression models, it would just be exactly the same model that you use for imputation that you would later use for analysis, then those models are continual. Uh, and the combining rules are really only strictly valid if this congeniality holds. But as Joe said, you really only typically have a problem if you make more assumptions in your imputation than during the analysis. So you leave out some variables in your imputation model which are important and the analyst later wants to look at these variables. You don't have them in your imputation model. Then you then you would get biased results. And in other cases, you often will find that this variance estimates based on the multiply imputed data sets would be a little conservative in the sense that they overestimate the true variance. But in general, this is only a minor problem compared to introducing bias if you leave out variables that are important uh, in your impu imputation model. Okay, so in that sense, uh, and continuity is less problematic if the imputation model is richer than the analysis model. You have more variables in your imputation model than are later used in the analysis model. Okay. So again, the general recommendation is just try to get as many variables in your imputation model as possible. You cannot do much harm. I mean, 
if you think of it, if you, if you add variables in your imputation model that really don't have any influence on your dependent variable, given all the other variables that you already have in there, then you're estimating a coefficient that actually is zero because they don't have any influence, but you're estimating it. So you have a little uncertainty because you still need to estimate it, but you will estimate it to be close to zero. So in that sense, you're not causing harm. You're just adding a little bit of unnecessary uncertainty. You're not as efficient as you could be, but generally you often would say better have a little, be a little bit inefficient, but, but get unbiased results. So that's the main motivation why you would in general, just try to include as many variables in your imputation model as possible. Okay. So a quick summary of uh, the analysis of multiply imputed data sets. It is true that these inferences that you get based on the multiply imputed data sets, if you use those combining rules, they might not be the best inferences available. And again, this is something that Joe already discussed, mentioning these papers by Jeremy Robbins. There are situations where you could do a little better. But again, if you try to read those papers, uh, good luck. They are really very, very technical, and, and those approaches are, are very hard to implement, and they typically only work in, in very specific situations. So I think the main advantage with multiple imputation is it's, it's like an omnibus tool that works reasonably well in a lot of settings. And you can do better in, in very specific settings with very specific methods. But I, I just think the major attractiveness is that this uh, combining rules work reasonably well in almost all settings. And it's just so much easier than any of the other methods. But of course, in, in some sense, it's still cumbersome compared to standard analysis especially with those multivariate estimates, these combining rules really require a lot of computation. So that was a criticism for multiple imputation for quite some time that people said, you know, I don't want to apply all these different rules and I have to program that myself because at that time it wasn't available in software. But this changed now. And, and as I said, all major software packages now have those uh, combining rules implemented. So you, use, you can simply use them. So for example, if you use data, you only need to type MI in front of the, the standard command. So MI rec, if you run a regression model, for example. So it's really very simple now to use those combining rules and you don't need to write your own code to actually use all those methods. But of course, we can only analyze our imputed data sets if we generated them. So we need to think about how to generate multiply imputed data sets. And okay, there's one more formula, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so as I said, a multiple imputation in general is motivated uh, from, uh, from a Bayesian perspective. And uh, if you're a little familiar with the Bayesian uh, approach, uh, with the Bayesian approach, the observed data are fixed and the parameters uh, that govern the distribution are the random variables. So it's just flipped compared to uh, the frequentist approach where you say, I have that sample and, and so my parameters that I get in the sample, they have some variability because it's only a sample, whereas the, there's one true parameter in the population that I want to estimate. So this is just, just the opposite way, right, if you look at it from a Bayesian perspective. Um, but it just helps to, to motivate uh, the, the approach for multiple imputation. Because uh, I, I repeatedly said that we want to draw from this distribution, right, the distribution of my missing variables uh, given the, the observed data, okay? And, and how would we do that? We would basically do the same step that we already did previously. So it's again another uh, Monte Carlo simulation basically. So what we do is we look at that distribution. Okay, we say we extend that by looking at the joint distribution of Y miss and theta, where theta now are these parameters that govern the distribution of Y. And we're integrating out 
the theta again. And then I can write this again as a combination of the conditional distribution of y miss given y ops and theta and the distribution of theta given y ops. And then I'm basically doing the same thing again. So I'm, I have these two, two steps. I first draw from this distribution, draw parameters from my distribution given the observed data. And once I have that parameter, I plug that in here and then draw my missing, missing values based on my parameter draws uh, from the previous step. And so this would be the two steps that I always do with multiple imputation. This is what I meant when I said previously, if you want to do proper imputations, you also need to take new draws for the parameters. Okay, and this is what we do here. So we take random draws uh, for the parameters from their posterior distribution, given the observed data. And once I have those draws, I can impute my missing values now using any model. So again, in the regression context, right? So think again of our, the linear regression model that we used in the previous examples uh, where we reputed y based on a regression model containing a couple of variables c, right? So what would that mean? We would need to take new draws for our parameters, so for the, the regression coefficients, I need to take new draws for the regression coefficients and for the residual variance, because these are the parameters that govern uh, the distribution with this regression model. And once I have new betas and I have new sigma squared, I can plug them in and impute my values based on these draws, okay? And we have two general approaches for doing that that have emerged in recent years. And again, Joe mentioned them yesterday already. So we have the joint modeling approach and we have the sequential regression approach. Um, with the joint modeling, this, as the name basically says it already, you define a joint distribution for your entire data. Okay, so the easiest thing would be to define a multivariate normal, for example. You assume all your data follow a multivariate normal distribution. And once we assume that, the second step, so now generating imputed values uh, given the observed data and my parameters, is straightforward because if you have a multivariate normal distribution, you know that you only need the, the vector of means and the variance covariance matrix. So this would be my theta. And once I have that, I can simply take random draws basically from that distribution. Okay? Uh, but the problem is obtaining these parameters is not that straightforward right? because Again, now we are only conditioning on y ops, and if you remember that Swiss cheese model that Joe mentioned yesterday, getting the distribution for these parameters is not, not that easy. So defining that uh, this distribution, they seldom follow standard distributions where you can draw from directly, but instead you would need to use MCMC methods to draw from that, from these distributions here. So this is the hard part. The first step of those two is the hard part here. Drawing from the posterior distribution of the parameter given the observed data. And this whole approach was discussed in detail and Joe mentioned that again yesterday already in his book, 1997, where he discussed how to do that under a multivariate normal distribution and the log linear model if you have categorical variables only or a general location model if you have categoricals and continuous variables. Um, but you can also use this other approach, the sequential regression multivariate imputation approach, SRMI, which goes under a couple of names. So it's often also referred to as fully conditional specification or chain equations. Uh, and the good thing about that approach is that you don't need to specify that joint distribution directly you only specify a set of conditional distributions. So uh, specify the distribution of yj given all the other variables and your parameters. So this would be 
the standard regression model that we considered before, for example. So you assume you have a linear relationship between your variable you want to impute and all the other variables in your data set. And you use a linear regression model to impute those YJs, okay? The good thing in this part is now it's, you defining these parameters is, is straightforward. You know the distribution in this case, so you don't need to use any MCMC methods for this step. Um, if you want to draw new parameter values, you don't need any MCMC methods. The only problem now is you need MCMC methods for the second step because we are imputing one variable at a time, right? And um, it's not sufficient to do that only once, and I'll illustrate that uh, on the next slides. So imputations are based on univariate distributions now, right? So I'm defining this conditional distribution of YJ given all the other variables by defining a linear regression model, for example. So now I don't need to find a solution how to draw from a k-variate distribution, but I'm drawing k times from, from these easier to derive univariate distributions for my k variables, right? And the attractiveness of that is that I can define different imputation models at each step. So if I want to impute a binary variable, I'm using a, a logit model. And if I want to impute a continuous variable, I use a linear regression model. And if I want to impute a categorical variable, I'm using a multinomial regression. So I can define my own regression model for each variable that I'm uh, imputing. Um, and the thing is, this is a iterative imputation procedure. So what you would do is, you would start with your first variable, impute that variable based on your regression model, go to the next one, use a logit model for that, impute that one, and so on. But once you're finished, you start all over again. So you start with the first variable again, impute that again, etc., etc., and you keep going. So it's like a iterative imputation procedure. And you can show that these iterative draws where you each time draw from this conditional distribution, they will converge to draws from the joint distribution of the data. Okay, because that is what we want in the end. I mean, we need draws from the joint distribution uh, of the data. The only problem is it's not really clear under which conditions these joint distributions actually exist. Because, I mean, you can specify all sorts of models each time. So again, a large model here, a linear regression model for that variable, whatever complex mixed effects model you want to specify for the next variable, you can do anything. But there's no guarantee that there is an underlying joint distribution behind all those models that you specify for each variable individually. And the thing is you can still keep drawing from all those conditional distributions that will always work. You don't know whether there will ever be a joint distribution this whole thing can converge to. And this is the main criticism of this approach that you're not sure whether there's a joint distribution, whether this joint distribution actually exists because if it exists, you can show that this approach will converge to that joint distribution. It's just not clear whether there really is a joint distribution. And that's the main criticism of that approach. But again, in practice, so far, there were never any issues discovered with, with this kind of modeling strategy. The question is, why do we actually need that? Why, do we, why can we not simply go through the data once impute all those missing values and then we are done. Why do we need to start all over again once we imputed all the variables? Um, the problem is just because we have missings in more than one variable. And if you think about that, um, if you say, uh, I'm imputing my Y variable now, conditioning on a set of X variables. Right, so I'm I'm fitting a model where I used where I use all the observed cases of Y conditioning on all my X variables. Right, um, the problem is these X variables now 
might contain values that have been imputed in a previous step, right? Because, I mean, maybe I switched to that to illustrate that. So this is a non-monotone missingness pattern here. So these are, would be my missing values, right? So let's assume I want to impute the first y variable here, okay? And I'm conditioning on all the other variables in my data set, okay? So what I would do is I use all those cases where y is observed and run a regression model on all the other variables in my data, okay? But that means I'm also conditioning on all these values that I have here where I initially had missing values in, in these other variables. And I'm, I, I have, those values have been imputed in a previous step, right? Okay, so now I, I, I do my imputation. Uh, but then I continue, and then I impute the missing values for this variable here, and the missing values for this variable, and the missing values for this variable. Now if I come back to my original model that I specified for, for, for my first y variable, the values in these places, they have changed, right? Because I imputed them again. There might be different values now. But this will also affect the estimates from my regression model. So I might get different estimates in my regression model now because I have different values in all those places here for the other variables, right? And the problem is you need to do that a whole bunch of times, you know, always going through all those models to make sure that these distributions that you specify, they stabilize. So if you do that long enough at one point, the whole thing stabilizes and, and there will not be any major changes depending on what you imputed in the other variables, okay? So this is the reason why you really need to go through the whole process a couple of times. I mean, general findings say that you don't need to do that very often and generally, and generally this stabilization happens pretty quickly, often 15 or 20 iterations will be sufficient, so this is generally the default. But you need to take that into account and, and all imputation software that is available provides features to monitor whether your iterative procedure already converged or not, and you, you need to check whether you really converge to that joint distribution, okay? Um, so this is the downside then for that uh, SRMI approach, that you need to iterate uh, through the imputation procedure for all the variables. But there's one exemption of that, and again, it was mentioned already yesterday, uh, if we have this monotone missingness pattern. And the monotone missingness pattern is, is pictured here, so when I can sort my variables in such a way that the variable to the left of the variable I'm currently looking in at is always observed whenever my variable is observed. So take this example. So my second y variable, and I'm looking to the left, so x is fully observed anyway, but y1 will always be observed when, whenever y2 is observed. The same holds with y3. If y3 is observed, y2, y1, and x will always be observed. Right? So then I have this monotone missingness pattern, and if I have that, I don't actually need to iterate because what I can do is you can always write a joint distribution as a product of conditional distributions, right? And so you can say my joint distributions of all my y variables given these fully observed x variables is just the product of y1 times x times the product of uh, y1 given x times the uh, distribution of y2 given y1 and x times the distribution of y3 given y1 and y2 and x, etc. Okay, so you can simply rewrite that. And now you can think of that just as being standard regression models. So again, I'm regressing y2 on y1 and x. And of course, if I do that, in this case, I'm running a regress regression of y2 on y1 and x, this regression model will not change even if I impute my y1 down here, right? Because I'm, for that regression model, I'm only taking the observed cases of y2, 
And of course, this model will not change because for that model, y1 and x are always fully observed. So it doesn't matter if I impute new values down here. It doesn't have any effect on, on this regression model. And so this whole thing of iterati iterating between those imputation models that, we, that was required in that example, I don't need to do that in this example. So if you ever have such a feature and you, you, you find such a structure in your data, the whole imputation process is a lot simpler. Okay, and you can simply just do that once and you're done. Okay. So, as I said, we never need to update the parameters whenever we impute the other variables just because those parts where I impute the data, they don't have any effect on my regression models because those cases will not be part of my imputation model. Okay. Now, if we compare those two general strategies for multiple imputation. So the Schoen modeling approach and the sequential regression approach, there are advantages and disadvantages of both. Uh, and the major advantages for Schoen modeling is that you know you will draw from that Schoen model, right? You specify that model flow. You know this is the model I'm assuming. I can draw from that model. So this Schoen model exists. Whereas, as I said, if we do the sequential regression approach, we can specify all those conditional models and happily draw from those models, but we have no guarantee that there's an underlying join model. Um, you can also show that this kind of modeling approach will be guaranteed to be congenial with certain types of analysis models. So again, think of the join, if you define a join multivariate normal model for all the variables, you know that any linear regression model that uses all the other variables uh, in that linear regression model will definitely be congenial because any uh, marginal distribution, uh, any conditional distribution uh, from a joint normal model will be normal again. And so these standard linear regression models will, will certainly be covered. So this is attractive because in that sense, you're ensuring congeniality here. And you can also uh, have the advantage that there's no ordering effect because with the sequential regression approach, you need to start somewhere, right? You, you need to start, uh, you need to specify in which order am I synthesizing my variables, right? Because I'm going through the variables one at a time. And you can show that in certain situations, this will lead to an ordering effect where the final results on your imputed data might change depending on how you order the way in which you imputed the data. But in general, this ordering effect is generally small, especially if you iterate long enough, you typically don't have any problems with that. But there are also disadvantages for the joint modeling approach. The first one is that implementation can be difficult if you want to specify more complicated models than just the joint uh, multivariate normal model. So if you want to account for the fact that you have categorical variables, that you have bounds in your variables, that you have these skip patterns that Joe mentioned yesterday, this specifying a joint model then for all those variables can be really hard and, and, and tricky in, in, in many situations. And Convergence there might also be slow if you, if you need to com set up complicated MCMC methods for that. Uh, that's not no guarantee that those models will actually converge. And things get especially tricky if you need to deal with complicated data structures that we often have in survey data where you know one variable always has to be larger than the other variable, like, you know, full time employees and total number of employees. You know, one has to be a subset of the other. You have these semi-continuous variables with a big spike at zero and the rest uh, is a continuous variable or uh, skip patterns, etc. And all these things, if you want to take into account and still specify just one model for your entire data, uh, it's pretty hard. And especially if you think of survey data where you have 
could have hundreds of variables, right? Then specifying just one model for all those variables, that's pretty tricky. So in, in practice, especially in those cases where you need to deal with more than only a handful of variables, uh, the sequential regression approach is typically the one that is used because setting up conditional models for each variable separately is much easier in that case. And it's also much easier to incorporate all those restrictions than if you only need to deal with one variable at a time. Makes life just a little easier. Uh, a few remarks on software. Uh, so the join modeling approach now is really implemented in, in almost all statistical software. So all these major uh, software providers, so SAS, Data, SPSS, they all have the join modeling approach implemented now. In R, there are a couple of packages. So Normcat and Pan, these are all packages that are spin-offs from standalone programs that Joe programmed at one point. So Norm is for normal data. So the based on the multivariate normality assumption. CAT is for categorical data only based on the log linear model and PAN would be for longitudinal data, which is a mixed effects model, again, based on the multivariate normality assumption. Then there's also a package called MP base impute. And this package implements the Dirichlet process imputation features that Joe also mentioned yesterday. Um, so this is an approach that also only works for if, if your data only consists of categorical variables. But in this case, it's a very flexible and, and very useful imputation routine, I think. Um, then there's also the Realcom Impute software. It's another standalone software. And again, I have to say I also never tried it, but it's they implemented a lot of features in that software. So I think it's the most extensive software if you really want to rely on the join modeling approach. They offer a lot of things for dealing with ordered and unordered categorical variables and continuous variables simultaneously and, and all sorts of, of things. So I think it's relatively flexible, but I never tried it. So I cannot uh, tell you anything how, how easy it is to use. Uh, then if you want to use the sequential regression approach, this is implemented in Stata and in SAS. Uh, in SAS, it, it works using the IVEver software that Ragu developed with a couple of colleagues. Uh, and this IVEver software is also available as a standalone. Um, and then in R, there are quite a few packages, and I only mentioned the most commonly used ones, it's the MICE package. So MICE stands for multivariate imputation based on chained equations. Um, and the MI package, uh, which was developed by Andrew Gelman and his colleagues, um, is also based on the sequential regression approach. And they are both, especially the MICE package, has been around for quite some time now. Uh, and I think it's in a pretty good state in the sense that it, it runs relatively stable and, and is, is pretty user-friendly in, in, in its setup. So I would recommend uh, looking at that package if you want to use the sequential regression approach. Um, and of course, I need to show the, the results of the simulation again. So this is the, this is the same simulation that I used yesterday throughout. Uh, and, and what we see is, of course, we get unbiased point estimates on the missing completely at random and on the missing at random. But compared to the stochastic imputation yesterday, we finally also get the correct variance estimates. So now our coverage rates are really back to the 95% coverage rate that we would expect for a 95% confidence interval. Okay, so uh, for missing completely at random and missing at random, the multiple imputation approach would really provide valid results for all estimates, okay? The only small downside is that we would not be able to get unbiased estimates for missing not at random. So if you remember, with complete case analysis, there is this one regression coefficient 
that would be unbiased even on the missing not at random. This would not happen with multiple imputations, well, with any imputation method in general, I think, unless you specify the missingness, the, the missing data mechanism. But of course, again, you would not know based on the data what this mechanism should look like, right? So if you would be, for some reason, you would be sure that you have this missing not at random situation but you also, the missingness is also limited only to the explanatory variables and the missingness does not depend at all on the dependent variable. This would be the very only situation where you would be better off using complete case analysis. But of course, in all other situations, uh, you should definitely prefer those amputation methods. Okay. And I have a few minutes left for evaluating the imputation quality. So this is another misconception, I think, uh, that people often argue, um, I cannot test whether the data are missing at random or not, so how should I evaluate the quality of my imputations? I cannot test that, so I simply have to accept whatever I get, and, and that's it, right? And I mean, it's true, you cannot test that. There, there's uh, no arguing about, about this first part, that you cannot test uh, your missing data mechanism, but that does not mean you cannot evaluate the other model assumptions you are making. And um, I mean, that's generally the main argument for modeling, that modeling always allows you to assess your model assumptions, right? And this is something you definitely should do with your imputation models always. And there's a nice paper by Abayomi uh, et al. In, in, it's in JRSSC, Channel of the Royal Statistical Society, Series C, um, where they suggest several ways for evaluating model-based imputation procedures. And I'll just cover uh, some of them here. Uh, and their ideas can generally be divided into two categories. So we have external diagnostic techniques and internal diagnostic techniques. And what do they mean by that? So with external diagnostics, they refer to anything that is evaluated based on external knowledge. So it's not based on the model itself, but just basically you want your imputed data to make sense. Right? So you know what you would expect for, for certain things, so you don't want any negative income, you don't want a small grocery store with a, a tremendously huge turnover, you don't want people that are older than 150, stuff like that, so just things that are not reasonable. You can check that and you should check that because otherwise your data does not really make much sense and you need to go back and find a better model, basically. So these are external diagnostics, and those should be evaluated by subject matter experts. Um, a, a simple external diagnostic is simply compare the distribution between the observed and the imputed values. So this is something, so what I did, for example, if I'm imputing large-scale surveys, you have that problem that I mean, you, you cannot really check all the models with great detail. So you want to start with a, with a general procedure that, you know, flags some, uh, some of the models that you might sh or you should look at more closely. And so I, I use that in, uh, approach for that. Uh, but of course, you have to keep in mind that even if those distributions are really different, that in turn does not necessarily indicate that you have a problem. Because if, you, if, the data, if, if the missing data mechanism is missing at random and not missing completely at random, you actually expect that, right? Because if you say, say uh, the example you have income and age, and income and age are positively correlated, so generally income would increase with age, right? And then you have a missing at random situation where the higher income values are missing, but you can explain that by age. So, or, or let me say it differently, older people are less likely to provide the income information, right? So then uh, 
income is missing more likely for the older people, but that also means in turn that the income that you observe will be the smaller income values, right? Because you generally would underestimate the income distribution if you only look at the observed cases, because you will have higher missing rates for the older people. And the older people are also those with higher income, right? Now, if I use an imputation method and I impute that income based on the correct model, the imputed income will definitely be larger than the observed one in expectation, just because I'm imputing the income for the old people more often, and those will be the one with a higher income. And so those income distributions will differ if I'm in a situation where there's missing at random. So it's not that you should generally say, oh, those are different. I think I have a problem, okay? But it's just a, 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 like a flag where you say, you know, if they are really different, maybe I should look at that and try to identify um, why it might be reasonable or not that they are different, okay? And I have an example here. So that's for our establishment panel. I have two variables. The first one is payroll, and the second one is the number of uh, uh, participants in further education. Okay, and the solid line is always the distribution based on the observed data, on the observed cases, and the dashed line are the imputed values. And what you, what you can see is that with payroll, there's really almost no difference. Uh, they are basically similar. But here, of course, you can see there's a large difference. So my imputed values are, in general, much larger than the ones that I observe in my data. Okay, and then the question is, well, is that reasonable or should I better find a better model here? Okay, and so if you want to examine that in more detail, you need to examine the dependence between the missing rate and the establishment size. And this is what I do here. So I have establishment size in 10 quantiles, okay? Uh, and then I have the missing rate in each of those quantiles. And you can see the larger the establishments, the larger the missing rate in the number of participants in further education in that variable, okay? So missingness increases with establishment size. But then it's also not surprising that the average number of participants in further education also increases with establishment size because obviously those very large firms, they can have like 200 people participating in further education, which would make no sense for those establishments that only have five employees, right? So the, the general uh, average number of participants in further education increases with the establishment size, but the same holds for the missing rate. But then it's not surprising that I get uh, this kind of picture, because obviously I'm mostly imputing values for the large establishments, because th this is where I have most of the missings. And for those large establishments, the number of participants obviously also needs to be way larger than for, for the small establishments that I have mostly in, in, in this data. So then it's not surprising that I get these differences. Okay? So this would be a way where you, you detect some things that look at least suspicious, but you go back to the data, you find, well, this is reasonable because my missingness pattern is just like that. And then you can say, okay, well, maybe I can accept those imputed values, okay? Um, the other part would be internal diagnostics. And uh, here you can use the fact that most imputations are generally model-based, and so you can just evaluate the model assumptions. So you could use standard Q, Q plots where you want to find out whether your uh, residuals are normally distributed, right? You could plot the residuals from the regression against the fitted values to look for heteroscedasticity, stuff like that. You could use bin residual plots, which I find useful. It's just um, instead of imputing the residuals individual, individually, you group them uh, depending on the fitted values and then report the, the, the average residuals within those plots. That's especially useful if you have uh, 
large-in models and you want to look at the, these residual plots, because if you ever try to plot those residuals uh, for large-in models, it's really hard to interpret them. Uh, but with these spin residual plots, it's, it's really useful. So if you're more interested in that, um, there's a paper on that. It's from Andrew Gallman proposed that idea, and I think it's a, a very useful way for evaluating models. But in general, I mean, you can use anything that you would do, that, or that you should do at least, uh, if you evaluate your models in applied analysis. I mean, you want to make sure that your model assumptions are valid. And of course, this also holds for your imputation models. You want to make sure that those models that you fit to the observed data actually are valid, okay? And again, an example for that, for, for two variables, the same two variables, so my turnover, the payroll variable, and the number of participants in further education with college degree. And you can see for the payroll variable, I mean, this all looks pretty reasonable. The, the QQ plot looks pretty good, so it should be on the 45 degree line, right? I'm, I'm plotting the sample quantiles of my residuals against the quantiles of a normal distribution. Should be on the 45 degree line. These are just the residuals against the predicted values. So I don't see any, any patterns in there, so there's no heteroscedasticity or anything. And finally, the binned residual plots. These are 95% confidence bins. Uh, intervals don't ask me how they are computed. It's just implemented in that software. But again, it's, since Andrew Gelman provided that software, I, I tend to trust the things he's doing. So I'm... Uh, I just rely on, on his methods here. But what I wanted to, to show with that picture is uh, here you can see quite a few problems, right? So the normality assumption might be questionable. This looks really strange here. I have a few points that are really far outside these plots. So this would be a model where you might consider, you know, maybe I should go back and, and improve that model because my model assumptions are simply not fulfilled, okay? So it's important to look at these diagnostics, just like what you would do with any standard modeling, okay? So to conclude, um, in general, it's really important to take that uncertainty from imputation into account, and multiple imputation is, is a useful tool to do that, but of course, these imputations are not free from assumptions, and you need to be aware some of them can be tested, these model assumptions, some of them can not be tested, the assumptions about the response mechanism. But in general, assumptions should always be explicit. And, and again, this would be my, my argument for using models in general, because you, in this case, you use explicitly specify what your model assumptions are, and then you can evaluate these assumptions, right? In other cases, this is, much harder if you just have this algorithm. There's no, not clear what the underlying assumptions are, okay? Mm. Analyzing imputed data sets, multiply imputed data sets is really straightforward now, especially since all statistical software can do that these days. Generating imputations is uh, still more difficult, I would say. Um, we have these two general approaches uh, sequential regression and joint modeling. Um, but the good news here again is that at least for standard models, you can use software packages again that are pretty far developed now and, and, and pretty useful. Uh, but still you should look at those, the validity of the imputation models. And this is, I think, a, a lacking in most of those software packages. The MI package has a few features for that but the other packages don't. And so you need, still need to do that yourself. And you also always need to monitor the conversions of your imputation procedures. We didn't talk about that a lot, but um, it's important. Uh, so if you really want to uh, implement multiple imputations, here's a, a guideline that I borrowed from the book from Carpenter and Kenward. Um, so a few steps that you can basically take. You can start first by exploring the missing data pattern. This is important because if you find that you have this monotone missingness pattern or you're pretty close to a monotone missingness pattern, you might simply 
start by imputing those few cases that will get you to a monotone missingness pattern and then in the second step use this monotone missingness pattern uh, because that really simplifies your imputation. You don't need to worry about convergence and all that stuff anymore. Um, then you can identify a few models that you want to fit in the end on your data and just check those models uh, based on your data just to, to be familiar with the data because it's really important to know what the, what the special issues are in your data that you need to take into account during the imputation. And if your data set is too large to condition on all variables, which you know is a standard recommendation, but in practice, of course, often it's not possible if you have hundreds of variables, there are a few things to decide which variables to select. First of all, you should definitely include all those variables that will be included in the analysis model later on. I mean, we covered that a couple of times that you would introduce bias if you don't do that. You should also include all variables that are predictive of the outcome variable. Okay, because this will always increase, yeah, okay, I'm almost finished. Give me two more minutes. Uh, we'll only increase the efficiency. Um, if, even if, if uh, this, the variable is unrelated to the probability that Y is missing, then you should also include those variables that predict the probability to be missing because this would make your missing at random assumption plausible. And once you have all that, uh, choose your ap appropriate imputation models for, for the different variables uh, and fit your imputation models to generate a small number of imputations. Make sure those models assumptions are fulfilled and then run your analysis model. And then if you find that a few imputations are sufficient in the sense that the conclusions are pretty clear based on your model, your analysis model, you're fine. Otherwise, you just generate more imputations because sometimes, you know, if it's, you know, you're close to the 0.5 significance level and, and you're not really sure whether it would might be beyond or below that based on the imputations, just go back and generate more imputations, okay? And then in, as a final step, you might want to explore uh, some sensitivity analysis to check what would happen if, if you're missing at random assumption is not fulfilled. But of course, this last step is the hardest one. It's not always clear how to implement that. Okay, um, that's all. I'm sorry for running over time. to get my headphone. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, the one of the, yeah, the one of the general recommendations that he made uh -huh. is to perform the repetition and uh, of imp imputed values then combine the results. Uh -huh. So that's one is uh, under the setting of random model. So you mentioned that when you, uh, you have a deterministic model, that is ma doesn't make a sense to repeat because you always have the same result. So what do you think about performing bootstrap? Yeah, with the uh, with the bootstrap in general, uh, you could you could account for uh, some of the the uncertainty in, in the sense that you would reflect the uncertainty from imputation if you had uncertainty. The problem is, if you use deterministic imputation at that point, you uh, you don't even reflect the uncertainty that should be there. So if you remember that picture with that regression model where we don't have a stochastic error term where you just predict your values right on the regression line, you're simply missing the variability around that regression line, right? And so 
this part would, would then still be, be lost and you would still underestimate your variance even based on that. <laughs> we can talk during lunch break if you want, or yeah. I'll give this. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.